Welcome to the Cosmic's Inner Space Podcast. I'm Cami K, Inner Space Surfer and Cosmic Creatrix at KamiK.com. Are you ready to launch a business? Expand your cosmic consciousness? Amp your intuition? Or simply celebrate the everyday messiness of being human? Then the Cosmic's Inner Space Podcast is for you. Inside each episode, we'll demystify the mystical and provide practical magic for everyday alchemy. We honor an intuitive and spirited lifestyle that elevates and explores life's multidimensional mysteries. Eavesdrop in on conversations with artists and authors, kick-ass creatives, entrepreneurs, and everyday inner space surfers just like you who are diving deep and glowing up in a whole new world. Stay tuned for inner space best practices and sustainable business tools to help you navigate the new now. Let these stories inspire you to cultivate your curiosity, elevate your mindset, and explore your own cosmic inner space. Let's dive into the show. Welcome, fellow inner space surfer. Today's episode is a juicy one. This one is literally eavesdropping in on a chat between two friends, because today I'm talking with Karen Chantafalski, aka Nerdy Girl Career Coach. Karen and I go way back to our days working together as career coaches in the MBA program at the W.P. Carey School of Business at Arizona State University. Karen has 16 years of experience, starting with her first role at Jobbing.com, a startup multi-local job board answering job seeker emails and finishing her tenure there as the director of job seeker experience. She holds an MBA from Arizona State University and is a certified job and career transition coach. Karen has worked as a career coach and resume writer for three separate MBA programs and two outplacement firms. In her current private coaching practice, she uses her years of perspective with a front row view of talent recruitment to help her clients move forward. Karen is passionate about helping people figure out their next career move and then how to get there. She's also a self-proclaimed dork who loves reading, sci-fi, biking, and playing board and card games. Nerds are her people. Nerds of all sorts. Karen loves witnessing the passion of people who care enough about a topic to learn about it deeply. And I know that she can help you navigate tricky career advancement tasks and make your career transitions more successful and way less painful. So we'll be sure to link her up in the show notes. So without further ado, welcome to my combo with Karen. Hi. Hello. How How, are you doing? I'm good. How are you? Fantastic. I feel like we were just here. We were just here. (laughs) So yes, um, for, for listeners, Karen and I had a, what did you call it? Power channeling. I freaking Mm. love that. I was like, yeah, that's what we did. It was intense. We had a two hour coach each other session. And we were tuned into the quantum. We were tuned into our higher selves. We were tuned in. It was so juicy. I was tired afterwards. <laughs> I almost fell asleep during dinner. I was so tired. Yeah. We, we yeah, we worked through a lot, lot, lot of stuff. So, um, yeah, I won't, I mean, I could share oodles and oodles about that, but. I guess, so, so let me start with this. Karen and I know each other. What year did, uh, cause I started at ASU. So Karen and I worked together at the WP Carey School of Business at ASU. <clears throat> I worked there from t- 2010 to 2018. And so mm-hmm. what year did you pop into my life? I think it was it 2011 or 2012 it was one of the two. Yeah. It wasn't long after I had been there Mm -hmm. and, um, I was career coaching MBA students and I was tasked with working with online MBA, evening MBA, weekend MBA and executive MBA. And so they had the coaches broken down to, you know, different groups of MBA. They had, you know, a lot of them supported the full-time MBA students. Um, and at that time, right, 2011, things were really different. They look very different than they look right now. And so mm-hmm. I was struggling with some of the technology pieces and ways to reach our online students. And I was like, I need an angel to pop into my life <laughs> to help me, to help support me in figuring out how we reach these amazing online students. But they needed more support and people weren't really engaging in webinars and some of the other things that we were trying. And so... 
So Karen f- fell into my life at that moment. Yeah. And I came to you from um, a background where I was working at an online job board and um, I was wanting to focus on, and I also worked in outplacement as part of that, that role. And I really wanted to focus on just coaching all of the time. And, but I could bring that, that online working for, you know, an online resource, I could bring all of that to the table. So we, we balanced each other really well. We did. And I remember in your interview, you saying, you know, you basically, they kept just putting more on your plate and like your role just kept expanding organically as it would, I imagine at a startup, right? Mm Because jobbing was a startup at that point. Mm -hmm. Um, And that you were building, you were answering all these questions of customers and you were building out, you were like, oh, I'm building out the FAQs. Like I keep responding one-on-one on one on and so you Mm -hmm. are so great at figuring out like how do we scale things Mm -hmm. um Mm -hmm. and really putting action to it so that's how karen and i kind of compliment because i'm vision strategy big picture and karen was able to help we would have these awesome sessions at asu where we would sit in there i'd be like i I need to know how to break this all down it feels so overwhelming and you're like we got this and just and we'd have like just a project planning yeah. session. And so I was able to bring that like working with IT project planning. Yes. Stuff yeah. Which it. that part still feels scary to me today, but I'm trying to mm-hmm. obviously overcome it. Um, so anyway, that's just a little snippet of background of kind of how we played together back then and the beauty of, you know, social media and life, right? You live in Illinois now and I'm still in Arizona um, and we've stayed in touch. And so we're both at this evolutionary stage with these new creations we're putting together. You're advancing your business and I'm at the very beginning stages of growing mine. And so we're like, let's power jam together and like help each other with. And the thing that you're really working on, which is why I've invited you here today for us to have a deeper dive into this is the power of storytelling. Mm-hmm. Um, so with that being said, let's dive into your story. <laughs> so tell me all about you. Well, you know, it's interesting. I don't talk about my story a whole bunch these days um, because I do so much career coaching. The thing that I end up focusing on the most is other people's stories. So just thinking about um, my journey over the last 10, 10 12 years and, and what it took to get to here, to where we are uh, right in this moment, um, just the past couple of days has been a little overwhelming. Um, yeah. I, I've had to In what of, way? In what way? In what way? Let's um, share with the people the process. Yes, yes. So I think it's overwhelming in the way that it's probably overwhelming for a lot of um, my um, clients is that, um, you know, it's not just a story, it's your life. Mm. Right. So, Mm -hmm. so, um, you know, it, it, we're, it's more than just this narrative I'm telling. Um, There's emotions um, Mm -hmm. that are connected with all of these different parts. And sometimes, you know, things that I worked really hard to move from. Mm -hmm. So anytime you're, you're telling the story and the context is like, how am I, how am I sort of creating an image of myself? Is it accurate? Like, you know, always really wanting to be authentic. And am I tapping into something right now that I don't want to be tapping into? Yeah. So just trying to be mindful of like when you're re-engaging, especially with parts of your past that are painful and you start to storytell because this will happen in interviews where you have to talk about jobs that you didn't like or managers that you didn't like. They'll ask I'll ask for that storytelling and it's like okay how do I engage with it in a way that's healthy in a way that's productive and that says things about me I want to actually say yeah and that you don't get triggered emotionally in an interview situation right right because they ask big detailed questions yeah, tell me about your biggest failure well that's right? a dumb fucking question first of all <laughs> <laughs> right I sometimes I'm like what it, we won't even we won't even get into my issues with the whole process of like hiring and interviewing. It does feel like things are shifting a bit, so yes, yes, that's a breath yeah. of fresh air. But anyway, so let's walk back because before we hopped on, before we hit record, I said to Karen, "I've been friends with you for how freaking long now, and I still have no idea how you got from French horn, which is what you were studying in college, 
to uh-huh. career advisor. So let's go back a little bit further and kind of just tell us like where you grew up and what you were into as a kid and whatever. Because um, on our coaching session, we also both shared that looking back, we see the threads of the things that we were interested in or the things that we were good at or the things that we had that brought us joy, even way back when we were kids. So mm-hmm. let's, let's time, let's hop in the time machine and go back a little. Yeah. Go back to little bitty Karen. Yeah. So, um, so when I was younger, um, two things I really, really loved. Um, so first off, I loved writing. I loved reading and writing. Like, um, I was a block away from a Carnegie library. So this Mm. big, beautiful library in a very small town and a, and a town where there wasn't a lot of these big, beautiful, uh, architecture, uh, Centralia, Illinois. So tiny town. Shout out Centralia. Hey, Centralia. (laughs) Um, a small town in Southern Illinois. And I had this gorgeous Carnegie library, a block away. So, um, reading was big and important and, and kind of monumental in my, Ditto. in my childhood. So, um, and you know, I could, I could sort of, um, leave this very kind of small town <laughs> by sort of traveling yeah. through all of these books. And it was like, I was always allowed to read, like there was no restriction there. Did you have the bookmobile? No. Do you know what Bookmobile exactly. is? Yes, I've heard of them, but we didn't have one in our town. Yeah, well, I went to Catholic school um, from like third grade to like eighth grade, and we didn't have a huge library at the school. Mm-hmm. And so the Bookmobile would come, and it was like, you know, a mobile book unit. And it was mm-hmm. just like, I just remember always being like, the Bookmobile is coming. <laughs> and then at the summer, too, did you have, we had in, this was in St. Louis, where I was at that point, um, the Pizza Hut, like, oh, reading challenge it. over the, is that what it was called? <laughs> Book it. Book it was like, yes. I was like, I give me another so gold star. Pieces. Yes. Yes. And I loved doing the, the book challenge because, you know, yeah. I was, it was like, oh, I'm going to get pizza for something I'm already doing. Yeah. Sure. Sweet. Yeah. Okay. Sorry to interrupt. Continue. Yeah. So um, books and reading and, uh, you know, stories were a big mm-hmm. part of um, my life then. And I was in love with Shel Silverstein was one of my favorite authors. I loved his Where poems. the sidewalk ends. Oh yes. my goodness. Mm. So, so in fifth grade, I entered young authors, young authors contest and I won for my school, which was so exciting. And I got to go to the, but they were for poems. Uh, they were for poems that were a lot like, um, Shel Silverstein's and I can, I can share a short one with you and it's about Thanksgiving. Please do. Yeah. So, so it's, uh, and this is one I had to read when I got my award. Um, it was Thanksgiving turkey on the table, grab a plate full, turn on the cable, gobble 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 it's all gone now look how much you've put on you did this in fifth grade yeah nice <laughs> isn't that amazing that's so awesome gobble 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 <laughs> yeah like, we're gonna eat and sit in front of the tv y'all yeah, right? yeah i think we all that's that's what thanksgiving you know was and is first many right, still. right. Yeah. so I, I i i channeled some truth there for people uh-huh. and spoke to them <laughs> love it <laughs> and and so um yeah so that that was kind of like early stirrings of Karen and I also right around that time I started playing French horn too mm-hmm. so like those are the, those be, were really the biggest things for me so you were a like, band kid yep I was a band kid and I was a book nerd and those were really mm, you're just painting such a lovely <laughs> picture I get it I'm seeing you yeah so that that was really um you know some of the the biggest things that I sort of used to explore the world you know um mm-hmm. getting to know the world of classical music and and music in general and um having conversations with other people through that medium and um figuring out how quickly um you know where when I was meeting people, I was a shy person. When I would meet people, I, I had a hard time connecting and verbalizing and, and, um, and sort of opening myself up to people. But with music, um, I, I could get to know people. I felt like really quickly and, and get to a point where, um, you know, there was that easy back and forth that I didn't have when I was talking with them. Mm-hmm. Mm. Um, so those things stayed really important to me um, uh, for quite some time. I think the um, and you continued French horn through high school. Yeah, yeah. And then and did I, that lead to scholarship for is that? Uh, 
all kinds of stuff. It, 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 it really um, is the thing that got me out of my little town, right? Mm -hmm. I got, I got uh, scholarships to go to school. I had other uh, musicians too that were, um, I, was, I was lucky to have um, a group of musicians that went through high school with me um, that were really talented. And because of them and uh, being able to learn from them as peers and kind of uh, develop through that, it, it made a big difference. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that peer learning um, was important from the beginning yeah. um, and then um, so I went through undergrad and um, my master's in where'd music. you go um, I, well, I I did a lot of touring in my undergrad <laughs> uh -huh. um, I was figuring some things out like a lot of people did in undergrad tell us and where you bounced around from I went I went um, it, so I started at U of I, mm -hmm. then went down to Southern Illinois University at Carbondale, where mm -hmm. I finished. Mm -hmm. um, and then once I graduated from my undergrad, I went out to Arizona. And I studied at Northern Arizona University in Flagstaff. And, and so I, what brought you from like Midwest to Arizona? Was it the program? Was it just like a really stellar music program? Like how did that get on your radar? Yeah, that's interesting. So I had a teacher for one year in my undergrad she was um uh, my previous teacher who i'd had since you know i was um in sixth grade i studied with him privately um he moved to memphis uh, and i i had uh, actually um auditioned to go down to memphis and and do my grad work with him and go study with him again because I, I loved studying with him um but one of the, one of the interim teachers that I had met uh, got a gig at NAU, and um, and she was like, "Hey, I can get you an assistantship at NAU if you want to go to Arizona." And all of a sudden, you know, I Google um, <laughs> Flagstaff, which, which I'd never heard of, and I was like, "Hey, that place looks amazing, beautiful." Um, and it was a great, it ended up being a great assistantship. It was with like the band program, which is not anything I had a huge interest in, but I was like, sure, I can help with the marching band to get, you know, my grad school, school for paid free. for. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I went out and followed her. I, I, she allowed me to put 10 boxes into her moving truck. Uh, and, that's and, so nice. And, uh, and, and move out there with her. And I helped her pack and, and get ready. She was also planning, I think, a wedding and stuff at the time. So we, we helped each other. It was the, that theme of mutual benefit. Yeah. Um, Isn't it awesome too, when those people like just sort of cross your path and it's like that whole reason season lifetime thing, right? Mm -hmm. Like sometimes people just drop in and then they drop back out or you and her, I'm assuming engaged throughout your stay there, but like mm -hmm. who knows for how long after, right? Like I, yeah, I just love that. Like if you're open to receiving it in a way that you're like, this is for a whole nother podcast, but mm -hmm. right. If you're open to receiving it in a way that is unexpected or like that you would never have guessed, like mm -hmm. you got a free, you got to put yourself on her truck. You didn't even have to get your own truck. Like that. I know it was amazing. It was amazing. Early she, days of manifestation. You probably didn't even know what you were doing. Right. And, yeah. and, she, and she got, a, she got a personal assistant during her right. move. And, right. and, and planning a wedding and when, when. all of it. Yes. Yeah. So, um, so we, we, we went across the country. I, I got to see um, places I'd never seen before. I'd never been through New Mexico mm. and, and I'd never been to the desert. Doesn't um, the desert look like Mars the first yeah. time? You see, like it literally looks like another planet. Yeah. I was like, Oh, I'm moving to the moon or yeah. like I, it, it was just completely alien. Yeah. And, but like, I couldn't stop like mm -hmm. just staring at it and just being like in awe. And it's then mesmerizing. when, I, when yeah. I got to Flagstaff, I was like, I can't believe I've never lived any place that was that pretty. Now, not that there isn't places of beauty in Southern Illinois. And I've, I've come to appreciate the beauty of a cornfield in a different way coming back to it. Yeah. But, um, you know, at the time I'd never been around mountains. And so mm -hmm. all of that really sort of picturesque beauty was sort of new to me. And, and it was, it was mesmerizing. I was in love with Arizona, like from minute one. Arizona is magic. I, is. I've it lived is. here since 2008, 10 of those years in Phoenix. And I've been up here in Prescott, which is Northern Arizona, you know, pretty close mm -hmm. to Flagstaff, a couple hours mm -hmm. um, for two and a half years. It's just, it's magic. There's just it's yeah it's if people have not been 
let's do a little plug for AZ. Well, just the desert and the whole Southwest is like, yes. it's just a whole different bag of tricks. And what's interesting is like 20 minutes in any direction, the landscape changes. Like you mm-hmm. think it's like the traditional kind of what you see in Phoenix, right? The, um, the cactus and kind of dry and some of that neutral palette or whatever, but like every single place you go in the state, it looks different. It's, it's yeah. really cool. Yeah. Well, and it, it was a different experience for me too, because I was used to being in places where all of the land was either farm um, or park mm-hmm. <laughs> or, or town. Like, like there was no unused land, right. right. Or, or sort of untamed open land. Mm-hmm. And I, I actually got to go to places where there w- were no roads to get through. Mm-hmm. Um, like I was, my dad even at one point asked me to keep sending him maps and I'd, I'd send him like, like the third or fourth map. And I'm like, dad, what are you wanting on a map that I'm not getting you? And he's like, well, I need one with all of the roads. I was like, oh no, I understand the problem now. Yeah. There are no roads there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hello, Grand Canyon. Hello, just I'm like, no, state land. Yeah. I'm like, I'm like, okay. So if you look to the right of this highway um there's nothing there Mm -hmm. it's just well there's something there but it's not like it's not roads and towns and things Mm -hmm. it's it's not a park it's just mountain and cragginess and I don't even know how you would start to like so just just having those unaccessible kind of um hard terrain areas yeah we're like that's that's like living in a in a in a mythical fairyland compared to like everything's already a park or a or a or, street mall or a farm it's something yeah. for consumption like mm-hmm. all, but like that is it's just its own thing it just it, is mm-hmm yeah, I remember when we when I drove across country in my tiny little VW Beetle convertible at the time mm-hmm. with two dogs on my lap. My dad was driving. I had two dogs on my lap and the back seat was full of stuff. I remember just thinking like how did people do this in covered wagons and on No joke. Of course. I don't like I can't I couldn't wrap my brain around like how people did that. Like it's just so brave. The journey well, yeah. and then now obviously being here and learning more about the land and the people who really tended to the land and lived off the, and like everything was in harmony and plants were medicine and, you know, all of that, all of those layers, which we won't mm-hmm. get into today, but holy wow. Right. It, that and, and I think that like speaks to some of the magic too, where it's just, mm-hmm. it's baked into the, yeah. yeah well, that's that, a cool experience. Like, yes, it was very cool. So was that, let's speaking of storytelling, was that somewhat foreshadowing of some of those challenges then that you like had to maneuver through maybe in college or working on your master's or like, let's step into that phase and French horn and. Yeah. So, um, going into the wilds, um, uh, coming to Arizona, that was really kind of where I became an adult. Mm. And, and I think, um, I had to do a lot of, um, growing up and actually figuring out what it were the things that, you know, you don't know which dragons you're slaying mm. when you're young, you know, you, you just don't know what fights, like you're, you're so immersed in the fight and you don't know, you don't know what those struggles even are. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I, I was regularly, I think getting my butt kicked by things I didn't understand. And I was just trying to make the next best decision, right? It mm-hmm. wasn't, there was never really an understanding of who I was, right. Or, or, uh, or what it, what was actually kicking my tail all the time. Mm -hmm. So with that, were you still, was there still something calling to you or speaking to you or on a higher level that was like keeping you a a bit above some of the like minutia of, you know, navigating through evolving as a human, right? Mm -hmm. Like, so was there still something that was like pulling you a little bit along as you stumbled across along the path? Yeah, I think um, I I let other people, um, uh, you know, I would anchor myself to other people mm-hmm. and 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 kind of uh, be drawn through whatever other people's stuff was, mm, yeah. right? Are you also saying men? Because I mean, well, you and I share a lot of the same DNA, right? Like people pleasing, over perfectionisticness, codependency. Um, you know, I mean, we don't need to air all of it right here, right? but. But yeah, for sure, like, oh, this guy's into this music. Now I'm into that kind of music. Or, right. oh, so-and-so dresses like that. That looks cool. Let me try to, work. and, and yes. try it on, right? And you're like, but yeah. this doesn't feel like me. 
right yeah and i was i was constantly just sort of like uh, I, tr- I was attracted to like really kind of over the top mm-hmm. gregarious people like especially being a little shy and retreating or, of kind of wanting to be behind it but also being attracted to like them you know wanting what they had basically mm. that being able to step into yourself yeah. and project and and give sure. um so I, I was I was attracted to to big personalities in my friends, mm-hmm. um, strong personalities and ones that ended up taking a lot of uh, the oxygen in every room that I was mm. in. So that happened in relationships, mentors, friends. Like that was just a pattern that kept going and going. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and I think you know it it helped me. Um, I, I think I learned a lot about what 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 was what was good for me and what wasn't uh, mm-hmm. good for me in, in that time, um, and I think um, through that, um, at some point, um, I think I started to go, okay, no, what is it that I would? I started actually asking myself, but what do you think? Mm-hmm. But but what do you want? <laughs> I think at that age, there can be a lot of like wanting to hitch our wagon to someone else's star instead Mm -hmm. of realizing that we are a star and that it's, you know, like peeling all that away is allowing, you know, that's how we allow ourselves to shine. But that takes a long time to, you know, get there. And I was still, I was, I was replacing parents, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And and I think that is a a normal thing too, is that when you um, move away from, especially moving away from the security of home, I was, I was looking for home again. Yes. In a new place. Yeah. Um, And, and really not knowing how to create home for myself. I was just going to say, right? Like everywhere we go, there we are. Like we are, we're home. We have, yeah, we have to find that within. Yeah. Yeah. And, And so, um, I, I just don't think I was there. I think I was just looking for it externally for a long time. Sure. Yeah. Um, but, you know, so in, in during that time, that's when, um, as I was completing my master's in music, that's when I started realizing like, hey, I don't know if I want this gig. So, okay. So you got an undergrad in music also. Mm-hmm. So were you thinking at that time you were going to become a professional musician? Is that mm-hmm. the path that you were sort of Yeah. On? Yeah. I, I was, I was on that path. And also um, I wanted to be an academic in music. I wanted mm-hmm. to, you know, probably French horn professor somewhere. Mm-hmm. Um, I, it was the playing of music and music pedagogy at, at a college level that was interesting to me. I didn't want to be a band director, never did. So I wasn't a music ed major. It was always performance. Mm-hmm. And then where did that sh- so walk me through a little bit, like you did the undergrad, you went into master's degree. Mm-hmm. And the, you know, the, and the thought was beyond that, I was going to go and get a doctorate in music after that. Like, cause, yeah. you know, that's pretty much the path of an academic. Um, but during that master's program, I started feeling like, A, I wanted, I kind of wanted to be out of college for a little bit. I wanted any, I wanted to experience something else. Mm-hmm. Um, and also I hated the thought of like still being a nomad for quite mm-hmm. some time. Cause at that point, you know, I'd, I'd been at several different college towns. Like that was like the third college town I'd been in. And I'm like, I'm a little sick of that. And um, I didn't like the thought of, of how unable to build community and build mm-hmm. roots that I was going to be as a performer, mm-hmm. that, that I was going to have to go wherever the gig was, um, that I was going to have to, you know, like that I, that I still had so much nomad. Um, and I was thinking, you know, am I, did I, did I want a family? Did I want kids? Mm-hmm. Like, I wasn't even sure if I'd even ever given myself room for thinking about it. Mm-hmm. Because I was I was so enamored of like the horn and getting out and kind of seeing the world that I hadn't even thought like, hey, do I want to like put down roots somewhere? Do I want a family? Mm-hmm. Do I want? So um, that's when I, I thought, well, after I graduate, I thought about, you know, for a split second, I was like, maybe I'll go get a law degree. And I don't even know where that came in. It was just like, it was like the panic of not knowing what was right. next. And I was like, well, I could, I could definitely, I could just go back and study more. <laughs> right. Yeah. I want to get away from being a nomad and going to another school, but maybe just diving deep into some other distraction yeah. will be right. the answer. Yeah. Yeah. And so um, luckily I had gone down to Scottsdale and uh, found it enchanting in a different way. And I was like, how about I just get an apartment and a job and like 
see what that's like. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, it, that's what I ended up doing. I went down to um, to the valley. I, I found an apartment. I found um, a, a gig. It was working for a marketing and demonstration company in their office. So the ladies that give out samples, it was the company that hires and contracts those ladies um, doing some back end administrative work. Um, so a lot of photocopying and data entry. Yeah. Um, and so what, what time myself. period was this? Like what year, what, where are we at um, time-wise? I graduated from my master's in music in 2003. Mm -hmm. uh, is that right? Yes. Yes, that's right. So 2003. Early um, 2000s then. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then um, uh, started with um, that marketing and demonstration company. Didn't It wasn't the right gig, and I was really isolated. Um, I made up for some of that isolation by staying uh, playing. I, I played in the Salt River Brass Band with a couple of musicians I really admired, Sam Palafian and uh, Pat Sheridan. Um, Sam was definitely a mentor of mine and someone I respected. He uh, passed uh, in the, a couple of years ago, or I think it's a couple of years, maybe just a year ago, uh, from brain cancer. Uh, mm. But he is a, a great force in the community and another, just one of those great mentors that touch so many people's lives. Um, so being able to stay connected to people mm -hmm. I admired and in, in, in music in that way. But it was it, it, like, I could feel the music was receding for me a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, did you as, have as any, did you have has. any, um, because I, I know having been through kind of some major pivots in my own life, right? Like mm -hmm. there can also be that, that <clears throat> not fear of letting go of the thing, but thinking, gosh, you know, I invested so much time, energy, yeah. money mm -hmm. into this endeavor. Um, you know, now I, I look at that kind of stuff very differently and I'm able to let go of some of that stuff. But like yeah. at that point, was there a little bit of like, was it easier to kind of fade it out by still staying, you know, having a foot kind of in that world in a different way but like you know pulling out of it was there an awareness of like yeah but like yeah it it felt like it kind of like staying in the ensemble for a little bit felt like I was just trying to keep a toe in and it mm -hmm. felt weird and it felt like a little bit more of a wrench like it just kind of stabbed me in the wrong way mm. at that moment I was like yeah this is just reminding me that I'm not doing that yes right it, it was like it was just like it was too little like I I felt like I either wanted to be in that or of that or I needed to just put it <laughs> aside for a minute and figure out like like I need to allow space for something else yes. and so that really um pushed me to doing a lot of you know build my own career coach I was started reading every career coach because like mainly I was like okay I have all of this stuff that I did and I studied like how can I put this to work in my career like how can I use this to help build instead of feeling like I'm just starting from scratch because I put too much work in that to make this like a, a like it doesn't count for anything mm -hmm. so um what the the first <laughs> real like career coaching spark I got was reading a book that is used by so many career coaches and I think it's one of the best like if you're going to only read one book um that's career coaching I think you should get this one it's uh, what color is your parachute right I saw the cover in fact I have it on my shelf right so, yeah yeah every single career coach does it's kind of like the bible of of like career changing right it's all about um figuring out what are those transferable skills what is it that you're bringing to the table even if you don't have experience in the thing that you're moving toward mm -hmm. um yeah, so that was kind of like the beginning of of me having an interest in in like job searches that basically I, I had to go through a, a massive career change and become my own career coach. Mm -hmm. um, let me interject and ask, um, were there, since, since we're all about intuition um, and wanting to, you know, really like help people tune in and tap into that, that um, innate sort of gift that we all have, but some people don't realize, you know, when they're hearing it, were there moments that you were, um, cause I know you're very intuitive as well, but were you aware of that at that time in your life and what did that look or sound like? I don't know that I, hmm, that's interesting. Cause I don't know that I thought at that time, um, that I was very intuitive. Um, one of the things that I started to see right then was, um, 
I had an understanding that that music wasn't necessarily about music for me. I, I think when you hear a lot of musicians talk about um, their connection to music, it's about the art, you mm. know, or you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But for me, it was about the people. Mm. It was about like, it was about ensemble. It was about connection and communication. Yes. And so I, I, I started to have a sense that, um, that what I wanted to find was something that allowed me to tap into that. Like that was the thing that I was missing. It wasn't the French horn mm -hmm. as, as, lo as lovely as the instrument is. It was really an ensemble. It was working with the team. Um, so I, I had a very isolated role and I knew that the job that I was working, that like me working in an office by myself on the weekend was the opposite of what I needed to be doing. Mm -hmm. um, so I remember looking, looking for a job and I started searching adjectives instead of job titles because I just kept not finding what I was looking for I just kept getting more of the same right so, so one day I actually searched the word fun I was like you know what I want a company that will, will actually talk about like I need some fun to get through my day. I need, I need motivation. So I right. need people that care about that. Mm -hmm. um, it, and so it, it was, it seemed like a frivolous thing to search, but it was something that was really core. I'm like, I need to, I'm a silly person that needs to have fun in my day. Yeah. So, so um, I, I found a, a, a startup, a job board um, that was looking for somebody to be like their admin assistant, but also answered the job seeker seeker help desk questions and I was mm -hmm. like that sounds I thought that sounded amazing I was like I can talk to people I can interact with them um, and it was like it was so cool to go into a startup culture that felt collegial it felt like that environment that I was used to and that I loved mm -hmm. of of young people energy and you know spending way too you know uh, spending way too much time at work probably <laughs> but, <laughs> right well and you were younger so you had lots and lots of energy right I had I had nothing but time and uh -huh. energy to give so it was a good time to be at a startup right yeah well and yeah. how awesome is that that you were <clears throat> pulled drawn magnetized to a job board like a company that literally helps people find jobs and that's really what your biggest question was like well what is next for me what am I right. supposed to be doing and yeah, so that's lovely. Yeah, I was. I thought, well, I if I want to explore the world of work, like how what what better place to do it? I was like, I was like, if if nothing else, this is going to be a good launch pad, mm -hmm. right? This is a good place to go figure some stuff out. And it ended up being that in spades. You know, I I met a wonderful mentor. My my boss Rebecca is is forever going to be my example of you know, tell me about your your best boss. Um, she was just an amazing teacher on so many levels of what it meant to be a professional, of what it meant um, to, to be a good manager, a good leader, and what it meant to really connect with other people. And how yeah. did she embody that? What were some of the qualities or ways of being that, you know, you, you would look at her and go, God, I want some of that. Like, obviously we're drawn to those people because we want more of that for ourselves. So what were some of those qualities that she embodied? Um, well, one of them was that she always gave people the benefit of the doubt. Mm. She, she assumed good intent, um, which as a person with, um, you know, at that time, un uh, undiagnosed anxiety problems, that was a really hard thing for me to do. And I didn't realize how it sabotaged my relationships with people to, um, to not um, assume that somebody was trying their best into, you know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. th because it was just anxiety going, oh, you know, they must, they must think that you're incompetent, or they must think that you're dumb, or they must, you know, that that's kind of liar in my head was mm -hmm. going full tilt. And so to see somebody that had um, this thing, she just had this complete compass of, of um, oh this person that I'm talking to that works for me is absolutely trying their very best to get this done and so like we always felt like she had our back like she was always there to help us and that level of just like constant there for support um, constant rock um, it, it just that absolute complete trust that I had in her that she was able to instill through that it was probably one of the greatest lessons I've learned in my career well and just to acknowledge, like, that's who you are. Like, oh. I, 
when you were describing, you know, the anxious you with those thoughts and, and, you know, making up stories in your mind about what people were thinking or, mm-hmm. or intentions and what I like, I don't know that version of you. I've never known mm-hmm. that version of you. So you've come a long way, baby. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that, that's some hard one, you know, and I, and back to the, I didn't know which dragons I was fighting. Um, I, I was so attracted to that, I think, because um, it was really a constant daily struggle that I, mm-hmm. I did, hadn't acknowledged at that point in my life that, that I was fighting. Yeah. So how long were you at jobbing and then what? Um, jo- so jobbing I, is what led you to ASU, right? Yeah, I was yeah. at jobbing for six and a half years. And, and during that time, I kind of rose from being a, an admin assistant to being the director of job seeker experience. So I, I was overseeing like all kinds of things that were um, job seeker facing. And um, and so what, the, what did that look like? What were some of the things that you um, built or that emerged from? you know, during your transition from this to this extraordinary role? Mm -hmm. Well, like uh, I did a little bit of IT project management around things that that faced the job seeker portion of the business because there's a huge part of the business. The part that actually generated revenue was facing the employers Mm. um, because that's where the money comes from. Uh, They weren't charging job seekers for anything. So it was a really interesting thing to like own the part of the process that would could be sent it's seen as like a cost center mm-hmm. um but like i had the the wonderful um privilege of them understanding that really engaging job seekers is is like that was what uh, the employers were paying for came for it right so just yeah. explain for people who don't know jobbing or at least at that point who knows what iteration their business is in at this point but mm-hmm. so at that point it was a job board the employers paid to be on there and promote their jobs mm-hmm. but there was no business model revenue generation going on on the candidate side. Correct. Correct. Obviously um, what you said, what the yeah. employers are paying for. Yeah. Except for then um, we got to a point where um, Lehman Brothers happened <laughs> and all of a sudden uh, we were in a mass unemployment event. Um, We went from having, you know, we had the nation's largest um, career fairs in our local market. So we were locally focused. That was our niche. Uh, We only had job boards in places where we had offices. So that that meant a huge real estate investment was made. And, and, and because the housing market fell that, that, that real estate, like having all those leases at all of those different locations was a real part of why we had to go from like 500 employees down to 50. Mm. So I had made it from like being employee number 70 all the way up to 500 and then back down to 50. So it was, it was a crazy time. Well, and so just to, just to put a pin in or a little, just like, you know, an asterisk, um, what a, what an amazing thing for you to experience for future Karen, who's coaching Mm -hmm. clients, right? Like, Hey, I've been through, total growth and then boom, knocking, knocking all the dominoes down and bringing it all back to basics. So Mm -hmm. that's, that's an incredible thing that, um, that's like foreshadowing, right. And storytelling. (laughs) So like (laughs) you didn't know at the time that you were being set up to have more empathy, to have more awareness, understanding, compassion, um, and also what it takes to then pick yourself back up and Right. Move along down the road. Well, and I was, so I was um, helping all of these friends of mine that were losing their jobs. I was helping them uh, get settled in new places and do their job search. And also we had launched an outplacing um, product at that time, which was companies that were laying people off, they weren't hiring. So we had to try to find something to sell them, right? Mm -hmm. So then we were selling outplacement services. So I was acting as a career coach for the first time through that. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, I had, I had spent a lot of time communicating with career coaches through my kind of community relations piece of, of helping, um, you know, our community relations team being able to engage with uh, career services in their different local markets um, to reach job seekers, right? And to provide them with resources as well. So like I'd, I'd seen these people and I knew they were my people. Mm-hmm. And um, I, and then I, I engaged in a practice that I, I still recommend to my clients today. I had an informational interview with Carrie. Oh, God bless the informational interviews. I'm still a huge fan. I always was a fan. 
And it, it, she was a wonderful career coach to me. So and let's she, explain what, what the informational interview is yeah. and then, you know, about your informational interview with Carrie and where that led you on your path. Yeah. So an informational interview is, is, isn't is like a normal, like a job interview. It's, it's where you're going to have a conversation with someone not to get a job, but to ask them about um, some aspect of their work. So um, it can be about the type of role that they're doing if you want to make a change into that type of role. Or it can be like, you know, I've never worked for that big organization that you work in. What's it like to work at X? What, what does that company value? Um, what are they looking for? And candidates, um, what's been your experience there? What do you like about it? What don't you like about it? Which is so important. People always forget. They're like, I remember when we were coaching all these MBAs, I need to go work at Apple and Amazon. I'm like, do you know? Yep. What have you talked to people that work there? Like it could be for you, but it might not be for you. Yeah. Like think about it. Like they, people would come to us and they would, they would say, oh, I want really want to work for this company. And we would know their personality and we'd <laughs> right. be like, I don't think you know the person because we knew the personality mismatch was there. Like people that wanted to work for, okay, so I'll just say the name of the company, Hinkle. Right. right? right. So that was Dial. That it, it, so, and, and there was nothing wrong with them. It was that, it, like that was, a, it was a German company that was yes. very kind of strict, structured yeah. process. And then we'd have these like kind of wild free, free spirits. Free spirits, come. yeah. And I was <laughs> just Because they like, all wanted to be brand managers. So there were right? these creatives that were thinking like, that's where I want to go be a brand manager for these products. Uh-huh. And we were like, mm, go talk to a few people that work there and then come back. Yeah. And then they would come back to us and they'd be like, oh my God, you saved me. Yes. And I'm like, yeah, right. Like, let's talk to you about like, what is that right fit? What is that right environment? Yes. And so I have a really quick story to interject about informational mm-hmm. interviewing, because this is literally what I would share when I was doing career coaching at ASU and built it into some of my courses or webinars or workshops about informational interviews because people dread it. And mm-hmm. it's like, actually, it's a really fun thing. So in college during undergrad, I was a broadcast journalism major. And for our senior project, we had to go do an informational interview of someone who had a job that we either wanted or a few jobs above what we thought coming out of undergrad we would want. So um, I had found that the program manager at a radio station, I was very much into broadcasting at the time and thought that I was going to have a career in broadcasting at that point, um, was the, uh, there was an alum of my school. I went to Lynn Lindenwood, it was Lindenwood College at the time in St. Charles Mo. Now it's Lindenwood University. Um, so Scott Strong was the program manager at a major radio station in downtown St. Louis, which is a pretty major market. Um, now, mind you, I wasn't going there looking for a job or anything. I was like, I have this project. I have to do this informational interview. So I think at that point, I don't even know if I emailed him. Like, was email a thing in the mid to late 90s? I don't know. I either emailed him or called him, right? You, you probably, I probably called him. <laughs> but was like hey can I come down would love maybe hit his pager (laughs) this was pre-pager I don't even know yeah that's in the way back machine so I remember reaching out and saying hey would love a quick tour of the facility would love to maybe meet with an on-air personality and just sit and ask you some questions about what it's like to be a program manager at a major market radio station cool come down here's the time and like to go from the suburbs in St. Charles Missouri to downtown St. Louis like I didn't spend a lot of time downtown I mean I did a little bit in college you know we hit the bars, uh, downtown occasionally, but it wasn't like I was really familiar. You know, it's a big city. St. Louis is a big downtown. St. Louis is a big city. So that in and of itself was intimidating just to Mm -hmm. get from like, I don't even remember that part. Like did, I guess I drove myself. I don't know. It's not like we had Google maps at that time either. Right. (laughs) Um, so I get there, he and I are meeting in his office. We're chatting. I'm asking him, you know, I have my notebook with my questions already and prepared. And you know, I'm like, how'd you get kind of like this? How'd you go from being at Lindenwood to, you know, being an on-air talent, working your way. He talked me through a conversation very similar to this, right? Not, not Mm -hmm. super scary or I wasn't asking him for anything. So through that conversation, then he flips it and he starts asking me questions. And then he brings me around and gives me a tour. And then he takes me into the studio and I'm like, holy shit, this is a studio at a major market, right? You know, and like the DJs look cool and fun and, you know, it's mid nineties and there's some like grungy, I was like, what? what? Like how freaking cool is this? He brings in the music director. Cause I was the music director at the college campus station. So I meet her, they give me a bunch of free CDs and t-shirts. And then she leaves and goes about her business. And he goes, so, um, what do you work? And I was like, what? I was like, yeah, I have a part-time job. I like waited tables or whatever. He's like, would you rather be on the radio? And I was like, what? <laughs> he said, we are always looking for part-time people to fill in on holidays and weekends. And when any of the full-time staff doesn't want to work, you know, we need some people on air. He's like, you have a good voice. You have a good presence. 
what do you think? And I was like, uh, yes, please. You know, so, so that led to my first, you know, opportunity. I, I had no idea going into that, that that could happen. And that's what can happen over and over and over again. But it also allows you to exactly what you said, see the culture of the organization. Mm-hmm. I got to be in there. I got to feel right. the energy. And I've done informational interviews where I was like, hail to the no. Right. I'm coming on board of this shit show. Thank God I came in here to talk to whoever because <laughs> I just saved myself a ton of heartache. Like what, yeah. if, what if you'd gone through the whole interview process and you get the job and then you're there and you're like, these people are loco. Yeah. So that's just a little snippet of a story that I always love to share with people because if you really just go in with an open mind and really it's an exploratory conversation, you're looking to connect and get to know the other person, evaluate sort of one, like you said, the role, like, do I even want to do this job? Is this something that I would want to do? Does it fit my strengths and what I can, you know, do I have value to add here? Mm -hmm. Um, The culture of the organization. Yeah. And you know, the other thing Carrie was able to get to talk, talk me through is because it was a career change since I was coming from a job board with this role like director of job seeker experience what is that I was coming from a a corporate startup um and And what was Carrie's role and where was she she was uh the uh career services at um gateway community college okay so part of that Maricopa community college network that's so fabulous in uh Phoenix um and, and she had a wonderful program. Uh, I believe she was director at that point, but I'm not sure. Um, but wonderful, both administrator and uh, coach. Um, and I had known her through jobbing. She had been in the community relations role there. So that was, you know, a, a former colleague that was doing something that was really like I felt like the right next thing for me, but I really wanted to talk to somebody in it. And she just went through all of the, like you said, the kind of ins and outs, but then was able to help me with the real, um, really important part was like, what objections are they going to have to me? What are their concerns going to be going in for like, uh, because I had had seen this um, job open at ASU and I wanted to apply uh, to WP Carey, the, the MBA program, because I had, I had just received my MBA um, through the program as well. So I felt like that was something I had going for me, um, but I needed help from her to like, how do I make a case that I can do this gig? Right. So like, that transitional, like, how do you, how do you spin your, your skill set, your strengths, what you do here, which is a huge part of what we coach people through that they, mm-hmm. they just didn't, they kind of would resist that piece too. Right. Or the, not even resist it. They didn't understand. I mean, I even have like executive level clients that I've worked with in the last handful of years that trying to transition, right. Like people can't mm-hmm. see, like you still did you, your brain still operates the same way. And so then it's just like, how do we then look at what this new role is and pull those strengths over and communicate the value of, well, I did this here and it looks like what I assume this bullet point in your job description is over yeah. here. Yeah. yeah. And it, and it was, um, also, you know, uh, being able to, it, you know, have them understand that I knew academia and why I mm. knew it. And, um, you know, my, my depth of experience as a student, but also as an employee at universities the entire time, like I right. worked at schools the whole time and, um, and, 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 you know, pretty extensively worked um, in some nice administrative roles that I think I thought could be, you know, very, um, very relevant. But, you know, she, she walked me through the, like, what are their objections going to be? And how can I speak the language that they would understand that they were listening for so that they would know I got it? Mm-hmm. And I think I never would have been able to to go and have a conversation with you and have you buy that I could do the gig if I hadn't had that conversation. And quite honestly, in that interview, I saw that and I understood and I know I know what I knew what we needed for that role, which was very different from what the other career coaches were doing. Mm -hmm. And so there was definite pushback. They were like, well, because the other coaches you know, like we said earlier, supported mm-hmm. the full-time MBA, which was a very different experience than what we needed to do to support evening executive and online. Um, they needed a lot more resources and access to things, whereas the full-time coaches were presenting a lot of that stuff face-to-face in office and or via a, a face-to-face class. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, yeah, I really was the advocate and the voice at the table for you because I was like, but that's that's not 
she's not going into that role. She's going into this, this new role that we're creating mm -hmm. to support these other people. So yeah. Okay. So you hop, we, can we fast forward a little bit and yeah, then we'll yeah, do, yeah. and then we'll do a little bit. I'm trying to be conscious of your time. Oh, sure, um, yeah. Cause I then want to get us to the star method, yes. um, which we've loosely kind of started getting towards. We're, we're naturally moving in that direction. I just want to wrap up kind of like getting you to ASU and then getting you to where you are right now. And then we'll kind of get a little bit into the tactical stuff and yeah. And so the circle will be complete. Yes. So I got, I got, I got the gig. Um, and, um, you know, I started my journey on, uh, you know, uh, coaching at ASU. There was a, a, a point then um, where, you know, I thought I would never leave that gig. Mm -hmm. And then there, there was just like this pull, like everything in my life, for some reason, I was like a, a big man in a little suit, you know, right. nothing, <laughs> nothing fit. Yeah. <laughs> You're like, neat. everything feels a little crunchy. Yeah. And, and, um, I got to that, one of those decision points again, where I was like, oh yeah. Like I, I started trying to change things at the periphery, mm -hmm. you know, and I was circling things. Mm -hmm. Um, but like there was one key thing that wasn't working out and, you know, it was my, my marriage at that point was it just, it, there were so many things that weren't working with it and, um, there was no talking about it. There was no getting any change to happen within it. So I just kept trying to change everything else. I quit my job. I started another random job that wasn't a good fit. <laughs> like, I don't know. It was just, it was just the, like, okay, well maybe if I keep changing all this peripheral stuff, maybe, maybe my life will be okay. And it'll yes. start to fit again. And it, and it was not working. It's that whole like bandaid on the bullet wound, right? Like mm -hmm. I'll just put a bandaid on this. It's, you know, it's hemorrhaging, but I'm going to just slap another bandaid on it. We'll try to like keep it tucked down there instead of just ripping that puppy off. And then right. I just, everything was on heal. fire and I was yeah. sitting here going, it's fine. <laughs> And so side note, you know, perhaps we're going to have Karen on, she's going to be our resident career coach. Um, so we can get more into this in another episode, the healing and the health stuff. So mm -hmm. just know that the Karen we're seeing today is very different because, um, you know, we, we can, and we should, because I have many health, health uh, challenges that I overcame as well. And a part of that is right. Like the stress, like we always hear like stress affects your health and, and people don't necessarily, it's like very ambiguous and amorphous and like, what yeah. does that really mean? It's like, um, when your life is on fucking fire, your body starts to shut down. Oh yeah. I, I, I got to the point where I felt like, you know, if I stick with this, it's going to kill me. Mm -hmm. You know, it was, it was just my, my health was tanking so fast mm -hmm. and I couldn't get any traction. So I, that's the point where I just, just hit the nuclear option, moved it, it back, moved back to the Midwest, started over, um, and was like, okay, this is me building it from the ground up. What do I want my life to look like? What, what serves me now? Not like Karen 10 years ago, not Karen two years ago. Like, what do I need right now? And I think that's when I got really clear, like, um, everything either has to be like, let's go ahead and swear. Everything has to be a fuck yes, or I'm not going to do it. Absolutely. And because when you're, when you start over like that, if, if you're, you know, we call that like the holy fuck, there's another coach. Oh gosh, I'm blanking on her name, but she called, yeah, it's like the, 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 yeah, the holy yes, the holy fuck. It's, it's fuck yes or fuck no. Yes. Yeah. Or it'll so, keep just showing up. It'll just keep showing up, right? Right, right. Like, because because I was I was living it, too many things I wasn't in agreement with that 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 weren't weren't true to me. You know, I I, I was married to somebody that like it really believed a whole bunch of different things than I did. I valued different things than I did. Wanted different things than I did. Right. And that was always going to be a problem. Like wasn't I was never going to be able to. Yeah. Yeah. And and so um and because I was looking, I, I you know it was like the, what we said earlier. You know, I was trying on other people's thoughts I was trying <laughs> and, yeah. and it kept not working out so um I I really I think that was the and I struggled with it too I still had a another whole year of kind of um no this isn't right no that isn't quite right and I I had a few more rungs to fall down before I finally started like one thing worked I you know I finally I got I got some medical help from like <laughs> you know I, I I was unemployed I I had I was homeless I was living uh, in a friend's guest room and I ended up on Medicare, which thank goodness, and and food stamps, and that was the moment. I didn't know that. Yeah, I didn't th know that. That was the moment where, like, all of a sudden, like this this kind of n nobody backwoods <laughs> neurologist ended up 
doing like these old treatments that really ended up being the thing that helped me. Mm. And then, and then I was just, I started trying everything. It was like, it was like, I had been so afraid to do stuff because of all the health stuff for a while that I just started trying everything. Mm -hmm. So me and my friend, we built, uh, I, I helped her build a shed from scratch. I'd never built anything. And we went on a big kayaking trip. I'd never been kayaking and all of these things. I, I started just feeling like there was a lot more possibility than I had thought uh, mm -hmm. previously. Mm -hmm. And, and all of these um, things that I wanted in my life just started showing up because like I, I was looking for them. I was, and I think I was getting some clarity on what worked for me, what served me and what didn't. Yeah. Well, and gaining clarity on your values and really mm -hmm. um, sorry, all these sunshine spots. Uh, there's, it's the disco ball sometimes too. Like it hits them mm. and then but I'm it's, right by a window. It's your so. fairy light. It's your fairy it's, light. Yes. I called them in and they're here. Joining us. <laughs> all your sprites. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so really it was, it, it ended up being, um, uh, just the best thing. And now, you know, I get flashing forward to this moment, you know, where I'm, I'm stepping more into my uh, private coaching practice, which it's been slowly ramping up for years and years, but making that like the thing. And it's, that's been a, a, a seed in the back of my mind. You know, that's, that's been a long way coming this whole time. Yeah. And so I just want to, two things. One, we definitely need to have a separate conversation on all of the health stuff, right? That mm -hmm. part of the yes, journey, but yes, also yes. a separate conversation of the building of the business, because I mm -hmm. think a lot of listeners are interested in, especially now, right? A lot of people lost their jobs. They're not interested in going back to a jobby job. And yeah. so they may want to create something, but they don't know what, and it seems really scary and overwhelming. And that's something that I'm trying to challenge myself with is showing a little bit more behind the scenes and yep. what that looks like, because I've been coaching forever. So I have the skill set to do the thing that, that I'm doing here. Right. But mm -hmm. I haven't run a business doing it. Um, and so that's very different. The, the doing the work versus building the business, doing the work. So I'd love yes. to have that conversation because I know, you know, even in the last couple of years, you have, have contracted with some universities and did, did remote coaching of their MBA students. And then there were some outplacement companies, but you're like stripping all that away and really like mm -hmm. building out nerdy girl career coach. Yes. So, um, I wore my my nerdy glasses just for you today. I love it. I didn't wear any because well, the <laughs> ones that I wear, there's so much glare. You'd never see my beautiful eyes. Oh, so. I love your beautiful eyes. We um, definitely are like sisters from another <laughs> dimension. Like when we work together at ASU, people are like, are you guys sisters? Well, Karen used I, to have blonde hair. I had blonde hair. So, yes. well, not natural, of course. This is my natural color. Which I, it suits your personality. Yeah, yeah. I think I think probably. I was uh, back to, you know, trying to blend into my environment. I was definitely trying to blend, blend blend in with Scottsdale well, a little yeah. bit with the blonde yeah well and and to 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 be fair we were all trying to fit into it so right um but so back to your um comment about the star stories because this yes. is a let's so, jump into that so when people come to me and they start um, wanting help with a career coach, um, a lot of times people, the first thing they really want is they they just want you to be their resume writer. Mm. They're like, oh, you know, like it, the, the one thing that people know to do is get out that blessed Word document and spend all of their time on that, that poor little sad piece of paper. And I... And the interesting thing is, is, is so little about what's going to get you the next gig. And, and if, if they had known like the thousands and thousands and thousands of people I've seen at this point, um, getting ready for the, the next thing in their lives of, of, you know, the resume has a part to play, but it's just, it's not the, the lead starring role. Right. Right. And we give, we give far too much time to it. But I think the big thing is, it's just like what we've been talking about this whole time. It's the stories that we can tell. Mm -hmm. It's, it's like, what is the story of you and how you got here? What is the, that journey? So before we get to the star method and what that is, where are those places besides the resume that people mm -hmm. tell their story? So yes. why is that important? Like the star, the star method will help us fine tune and refine the story. Where are those places then that we take that 
what we get from that? Where do we pepper that throughout the, the job seeker experience? Yeah, um, it, it's in the profiles that we write about ourselves online, you know, mm -hmm. a bio may be on the company's uh, website or um, your, your LinkedIn profile page where, you know, most people do their networking um, online for work. Um, but also um, the conversations we have with people, maybe at, at, you know, once networking events happen again, or, you know, the casual conversations you might have waiting for your oil to get changed or um you know just the the way that you might talk in an interview mm -hmm. um it, just the the way you professionally story tell um what are those details that you bring out about yourself when you're talking to other people about the work that you do yeah and that requires work right like you have to know what those little gems and nuggets are in your story because maybe you end up at dinner at a friend's house and the vp of ABC company is there and you're like holy shit like we always hear about the elevator pitch but really it's mm -hmm. like it is like it is important to condense it down into a sound bite because we still live in that sort of world right because initially that's all you get is that little mm -hmm. sound bite moment so say you're at a dinner party and the VP of yada yada is there yeah once you get past the initial like hey introduction whatever what are those little nuggets then that you maybe can share that that's going to perk their ears and go oh you know like oh, interesting, we may want a you at our organization. Yeah, because I don't have two hours to tell them <laughs> about how I started off playing French horn and how I ended up uh, running my own career coaching business. Right. Like that's, we've, we've stepped through it. It's, it's a hard story. Well, to yeah, tell. that was an hour. That was right at an hour that we told your story, right? And so mm -hmm. then what are those little gems and nuggets? Yeah. Right, yeah. So people come to me and, and they ask me, you know, like, Karen, tell me a little bit about what you do. And, and the thing I can say now is I've really thought and distilled down what it is I'm doing when I'm working with clients, what it is that is kind of like has always been important to me, and that's storytelling. Mm -hmm. And so I don't talk to them about doing resumes. I don't talk to them about the fact that I'm preparing people for interviews and stuff like that. I, I, I tell them, you know, I help people um, clarify and tell their stories so that, you know, their strengths come through, um, their talents come through, and they can connect with the best possible fit because I'm passionate about people, um, you know, that, that we don't have to be miserable at work, that, that like there is so much variety in the world of work that there is a place that's a good fit for everybody and a good fit totally. for everyone's tal talents. Totally. So um, I want people to be happy and, and love what they do at work because we have to spend a lot of time doing that stuff. <laughs> so, so let's just share what STAR stands for. Mm -hmm. And then let's walk through what that might sound like, like what we might sh put into that format. Right. So um, STAR stands for situation, task, action, and result. So when you're breaking down, um, like let's say in an interview, somebody says, uh, Karen, can you tell me about a time uh, where you... <laughs> the old tell me about a time. <laughs> tell me about a time where you made a mistake. And I can tell them about the time that I accidentally ordered $2,000 worth of tape. And so... <laughs> <laughs> Tell me all about it. Right. So this is what it, it looks like. So the situation was that um, I was um, working as an admin assistant. I answered the phone call one day from a, a, a salesperson who was selling office supplies. Now, we already had an, a negotiated agreement with a company where we got our office supplies, but he, he just wouldn't let me go and I couldn't say no. So, so I, I, story. I placed what I thought was going to be like a little like 12, $12 order of, of just, you know, some tape and some sticky notes and, you know, nothing big. And um, it's just one, I forget about it promptly. And then it all starts showing up. It's just the boxes start coming in. I'm like, what is this? Why, why is there a wall of boxes in front of me? And I ask and I get this, this invoice and there it is like $2,000 oh worth of tape. I accidentally, instead of getting like, I, I, I ordered gross of things, oh, gross, geez. a gross of things instead of, you know, a thing. And it was, it was a deceptive sales practice mm. that they were engaging in. And so in order to, to return it, I had to, then it was going to be like $300 to restock it. So immediately how I handled it was I, I, I took the, the, the receipt and I went into the CFO's office and I was like, look, right. I've 
I've made a mistake. I was like, this is what happened. And now we have $2,000 worth of tape. And true to a CFO, he, he sat there and he did the math to see if it was a good deal on tape. And I, I, you know, it does the best CFO reaction I think I've ever yes. had, but, um, because I, 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 I actually, I, I think I, I might have, um, put my hand on his arm and I was like, wait a minute, I need to just ground this in the fact that we will never use this much tape. <laughs> holy cow and so anyway so the, the 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 action i took so in that in that situation um so the situation really was the mistake right mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and you know the, the one thing i have to say here is that people usually spend too much time on the situation, the situation yes. because the setup's already in the question right so here's the mistake i make. so i i usually keep the story pretty short about yeah. i made a mistake and i ordered two thousand dollars yeah and, and then the action i took is i went and i communicated Owned i owned it I owned it. I said, this is what I did. I made a mistake. And I sought out help from someone that might have an idea of how we might handle it. And, um, and then the outcome. So this, the result is um, we were able to, to pay the couple hundred dollars to restock it and send it back. And I also learned how to say no to salespeople Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and, you know, we, we negotiated these contracts for a reason so we could get the best possible deal. I just kind of stuck with it, you know, like going forward, um, if, if, uh, uh, something needed to be tried that was different I would engage the other people that were involved in making the decision the first time yeah yeah and 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 really you know and not feel pressured on the fly Mm -hmm. into into doing something that that you know wasn't actually really evaluated and studied to make sure it was like you know Mm -hmm. the best practice so I learned so much about how a business makes decisions why they make decisions and you know going forward it was much easier to be informed of like no like and because I'm not the person that makes the decision and we already have something in place yeah you know it was just very easy and clear but you know that was an important early career thing to learn. Yes. Well, and a super awesome example of a star story, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> so you killed two, you checked two things off the list, right? Like um, how to answer, tell me about a time you made a mistake um, and then using the star method to tell that story. So thank yeah. you for the bonus lesson. Yes, yes, um, yes, absolutely. You know, I remember coaching a lot of MBA students and um, the other piece too, like the result, the R. Mm-hmm. Um, so there was also like, here's the situation. Here was the task at hand. Here's the action steps and really breaking down those steps. So first I did this, then I did this, then I did this. It resulted in increase in sales by this to this, this percentage, this number, yes. or a decrease in this from this to this, you know, year over year, Q1 to Q2, like whatever, yep. whatever yeah. that sort of, you know, but the number piece and the showing the results. And that's where people get kind of locked up because we're not taught to keep track of yeah. Yeah. So you really do have to go into the archives, right? Of like, hmm, and think about specific examples where you did increase, decrease, you know, how did you add value to that situation? Um, and so the, I remember that being the piece that was always the hardest. Like people could yeah. get the situation and they could even sometimes they would get a little lengthy even in the in the um the action steps, right? Like mm-hmm. so we would we would talk to them a lot about first you did this, then you did this, then you did this, like three steps. And then let's talk more the let's spend the bulk of the time talking about that juicy result. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, wait the action and result part I think is probably yes. that's so where they can also see how your brain works, your, mm-hmm. right? When you walk through those steps, then they see how you think, how you process this information right yeah and they also see you know the the reason those behavioral questions are even asked is because you know your, your past actions are the best predictor of your future actions mm-hmm. how you handled something in the past is very much um a good predictor of of how you're going to act in the future and on top of that like um so the example I gave was a negative example. So there's one more step past that R. If it is a negative example, if if it is a story where you're having to talk about a mistake or a difficulty or um, something that's a challenge for you or a weakness, the next thing you really want to get to is talk about the lesson you learned. So yeah. they, there's an optional L. It's, it's like star R star <laughs> it's a lesson learned um so if it's that negative thing and that's what i got to at the end right there in my example 
is I started talking about, and I, that was a very long winded star story. Sure. I, I have to get it a little more, more compressed uh, oh. for an actual interview, but that, that lesson learned of being able to say in the future, this is what I would yes. do differently or this, in the future, I, this is how I handle I those this. things. Yes. Yes. Of, of really like having them say like, okay, I saw that my my obstacles or my failures I see as an opportunity to learn and a big thing that's important to companies right now is that you have that growth mindset that you're yes. not you're not taking failures and blaming other people and looking other places oh yeah you're always taking it as an opportunity to learn and grow so that being able to give those lessons learned is how you communicate that growth mindset and, you know, we know because we talked a lot to the employers and, and you still have more recently than I have, right? Mm -hmm. Like a lot of companies, especially now in lieu of what's just happened with our world this last year, right? Like adaptability, mm -hmm. flexibility, um, not being attached to outcomes, but also not being afraid to fail and fail fast. So we know right. specifically one company, Amazon, a lot of our students would go to work at Amazon and they would say, we need people who are open to fail, to failing. We don't get new fresh ideas by people trying to figure out and like, you know, hemming and hawing and not being able to make a decision and just wanting it to be perfect. Um, so I think there's a false narrative around like, well, I think that's part of what's the, on the way higher level, dismantling all the ish in 2020 and old systems and processes that no longer work or serve us, which mm -hmm. is back to the storytelling piece and the coaching that you and I did two days ago, is how do we make sure we're showing up super authentically? Because when we try to put this false face on, right. that's just not, one, it doesn't resonate with people. That's not what people want. And that's not where we feel the most fulfilled. That's not right. where we get to show up and like, have juicy fun sessions with clients and or whatever it is people are doing in their jobs yeah the, usually the the first time I start working on people working on the, working on uh storytelling with people um especially interview preparation uh, with that in mind you know people um say, you know, I, I don't like being fake and I don't like bragging. Those are two uh, mm -hmm. stumbling blocks that people have um, when they're going into this. So they're like, oh, I, that feels like bragging or um, I don't really like talking about, well, tough on the, the, the you don't feel like talking about yourself. Right. Uh, but like that's the, the whole point of this is that you do have to practice yes. talking about yourself in that particular way. It's a, it's a weird type of conversation mm. that people aren't used to having like storytelling, like you're used to telling stories about your personal life, about your family life, um, but getting used to telling stories about your professional life does take practice. It's a practice. Yes. Skill. So, um, the other thing is because it feels different that then that sometimes translates into like, I feel like I'm being fake if I'm being, right. or if I'm being professional and showing respect and, and boundaries and stuff like that feels like fake to me because like I'm used to like my impersonal communication style. So what is that like middle ground, right? Yeah, yeah. Like, so so I'm like, well, you know, it is authentic to be respectful in an environment where somebody has earned respect. So it's like the first thing we talk about that that respect and boundaries and professionalism is about um, creating rules of engagement that allow yes. safety for everybody and allow us to conduct business free of the types of of fights, arguments, dramas that happen in family life and personal life because people don't have boundaries. Yeah, that's a whole nother right? episode, right? Right. So like we have to even get to the heart of like what why does professionalism exist? Why mm -hmm. does that why do those respect and guidelines exist? And so like you can still within that communicate who you are authentically, talk about the things that matter to you, but you have to get really clear on that. And you have to get really clear on how to talk about that professionally, respectfully, and in, in that business context. So mm -hmm. it's a, it's a lot to practice, but yes. you know, who you are as a person absolutely has to come out. Like the last thing you should do uh, is, is fake being somebody you're not right. you're just going to talk yourself into a job. That's the wrong fit. Totally. Yeah. That was a lot. That was, that was a lot. That was a big download. We're like power channeling again, girl. Yeah. <laughs> so, so just in, we're, we're at 20 minutes after the hour. And so just to also one final thread is then, so we pepper that, we, we get that, you know, crystallized mm -hmm. and we pepper that through 
what are those places that we then are able to, once we're able to communicate about that a little bit more effortlessly, where are then again those places that we pepper that information through? Yeah, like so um, one thing is if we get some really good accomplishment based stories, um, some really good um, star stories and examples that you want to have come out in the interview, you then start reverse engineering the, the interview with your resume. Mm -hmm. And so I'd like it's really getting to that point where you can talk about your strengths and stories that highlight those strengths. Like it's not enough to take the assessment. I need I need examples of yes. how those 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 strengths show up in your work life. So coming up with those examples and then weaving those stories, featuring those stories in your resume and condensing that star story down to like, okay, the situation and the task is really like the company and the, um, the uh the title that you're in and the action result is what happens in each one of those bullets so if you're mm -hmm. thinking about the bullets just in that way maybe you know what is the problem that i solved the action that i took and the, and the outcome making sure that's that's in each one of your bullet points you will have like the most juicy resume and they're going to get a clear picture of you so that's mm -hmm. one place it also can show up in your linkedin profile how you tell a story about yourself you know these are the things i'm passionate about this is how i'm hardwired to show up to play and and these are the results that i've been able to get for people um and businesses and maybe i could get these types of results for you too um and then um you know even to like how you reach out to people on linkedin or or how you initiate conversations with with other people in your profession. You know, I think having a conversation having conversations with other career coaches has helped me more than anything else to become a better career coach. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, so if you're not engaging with other people that do the work that you do, like what are you? Why are you missing just... it? It's it's like it's like when I started my MBA and I was doing all of my MBA course coursework by myself. Mm. You know, like I was just alone in my apartment trying to like figure <laughs> out all of this math. And I realized like that's how I, I muscled my way through too yeah. many degrees and things before. I'm like, no, if I just talk to the other people that are also doing the same right. thing, we get best practices. I get, totally. I get clarity on things that I have maybe like the wrong impression of. I, I find out earlier if I'm making a mistake, mm -hmm. you know, like all of the things that um, would be such a struggle to figure out on your own, just engaging with other prof with peers yeah. is and that's where the the referrals and recommendations come in too that's how you get pulled into organizations we could talk about that another time but yeah i'm feeling like what's coming from this too is like maybe we do some sort of facebook um or instagram like lot maybe not even a live or just record something and share it there like some sort of office hours mm -hmm. um where we can share some more of these specific types of tips because it's obviously so rich we could well, you and i could talk for days mm -hmm. um so i so appreciate appreciate you hopping on here and sharing your story. Yes. It was fun to learn things I did not know about you. I always Well, it's it was fun to story tell about my life. I like I I feel like I got to have a nice little retrospective. This is a really great time to check in with that too. Like I would actually recommend if you have a chance to to talk to somebody about your story um in the next yeah. couple of weeks, do it cuz you know, um it biographize yourself a little bit, write a little journal entry, because this has been a great reflection for me, and then preparing me into the, the going into the new year, what, what do, do I want to bring with me, and what do I maybe want to trash and leave behind? Me? Yeah, where you want to turn the volume up, or turn it down, or delete the file altogether, right? Yep. Um, yep. So in, um, in closing, where can people find you? How do they mm -hmm. find you? How do they get to your juiciness? How do they get to work with you, or at least follow along, so that perhaps one day when they may need your um, brilliant genius. Uh, where do they find you? Well, um, you can find me at www.nerdygirlcareercoach.com. Uh, um, I'm also Nerdy Coach Karen on Twitter, and they can find me at Facebook. Um, I'm. You could, if you search Nerdy Girl Career Coach, you'll you'll find me there too. Yes. And I know you're on LinkedIn as well, doing a lot yeah, of stuff yeah, yeah. On, on the LinkedIn's. So, mm -hmm. you know, also there's the Google, um, <laughs> nerdy yeah, old career I, coach. <laughs> yeah. And Karen Chantafalski will get you, yeah. it will get you me a hundred percent, but I don't want to make you spell Chantafalski. Right. So nerdy girl career coach it is. Yes. And I will put all of the links and we'll link it up in the show notes so that we make sure everybody that needs to find you can find their career coach, sage, angel. Yeah, All the I, things. I, I'd love to help you tell your story. I'd, I'd absolutely be delighted to do it. 
Well, I appreciate you so much um, as a friend and as a professional and being just a superstar at what you do. And I'm so excited to share you with the people, even though we're a baby podcast and we're just getting started. (laughs) So I'm not sure, but we'll make sure we put this one back out there in rotation a couple of times so that people who join us later down the road know that they can go back to the library archives and find this gem of a conversation. Um, I love you. I love you. I love you. And thank you so much for having me today, Cammie. Yes. Thank you. Wow. What a jam packed and juicy combo, right? I'm super grateful to my sweet soul sister, Karen Chantapalski, AKA nerdy girl career coach for joining me here today and for sharing her story and for schooling us on how to use the star method as a power tool to share sound bites and stories for using on resumes, cover letters, on LinkedIn profiles and other online profiles, and most especially for sharing in interviews or at networking events. I hope you gained some value from Karen's extensive knowledge and insights. And if you're in need of some career advising or assistance, don't hesitate to reach out to Karen. You can find her at her online home base at nerdygirlcareercoach.wordpress.com or she's at Nerdy Coach Karen on Instagram. You can also find her on Facebook, Nerdy Coach Karen. Thank you so much for sharing your time and space with me today and for tuning in. If you enjoyed this episode of the Cosmics Inner Space podcast, please leave a review on iTunes or go ahead and share this episode with a friend who might enjoy some of this juicy goodness. I'd love to stay connected with you. On Instagram, you can find me at kamike.com. That's K-A-M-M-I-E-K-D-O-T-C-O-M, where I do share a lot more Cosmics Inner Space vibes on the Insta stories. And I'm at kamike.com on the Facebooks. And of course, we can always stay connected 